On this week in Enterprise Tech, we have Mr. Kurt Franklin and Mr. Brian Chi here today. Now, screen time for minors has always been a hot topic, especially in this house. And China's taking it to the next level, and so is its game publishers. We'll talk about what dialing up the protection actually means there. And we also get right into the right to repair laws and just how they will impact different parts of the industry. Plus, ZDI, the Zero Day Initiative, has been a huge successful program after the, over the last 15 years. Today's guest, Dustin Childs from ZDI, is going to take us through a bit of history of the program and just how impactful it truly has been. Shouldn't miss it. It's why on the set. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Twyatt. This Week in Enterprise Tech, episode 451, recorded July 9th, 2021. E.T. Pone Home. This episode of This Week in Enterprise Tech is brought to you by Indava. Subscribe and listen to Tech Reimagine, the podcast from Indava, from wherever you get your podcasts. And by ESET. ESET boasts ransomware protection that means business with internet security products and services backed by world-class research and tech support. Learn how to protect your business from ransomware at business.eset.com slash twit. And by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or try it for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarn.com slash twit. Welcome to Twyat This Week in Enterprise Tech, the show that is dedicated to you, the enterprise professional, the IT pro, and that geek who just wants to know how this world is connected. I'm your host, Louis Moresca, your guide through this big world of the enterprise. I definitely can't guide you by myself. I need to bring in the professionals and the experts in their field, starting with our very own network and security expert and all-around techie, Mr. Brian G. Cheever, how are you, my friend? Uh, what's been keeping you busy? I'm <laughs> still unpacking boxes, <laughs> discovering, <laughs> hmm, where did I put that? Uh, but, hey, that's right. We, uh, we're getting ready to go and do our first driving tour of the East Coast, we're going to go visit the Northeast and uh, ought to be interesting. And uh, really looking forward to being able to just get up and drive instead of having to sit in a plane for five hours just <laughs> to get anywhere. I get that. Now, you, uh, you're you you're basically following the tail end of the tropical storm. Hopefully, you guys won't get too much weather on your way up. Um, I'm not sure I really call it tail end because we're in Orlando and it's up past Georgia. So all we're going to go through is a little bit of rain, so it shouldn't be that right. bad. Right, right. Well, safe travels, safe travels. Well, speaking of busy, and also he's our security and enterprise expert as well. He's all around amazing guy. He's a senior analyst at Amdia, and he's Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, uh, how are you doing, my friend, and how's the Sunshine State treating you? Well, at the moment... It's looking like the Sunshine State, so it's not <laughs> bad. Um, getting ready to head out for a trek up the uh, the East Coast, going to uh, see our sun. But uh, it's, a, it's a good time. In between all of this, I'm getting ready for Black Hat. I've recorded my content for the Omdia Analyst Summit at Black Hat. Got some more stuff coming, and I'm looking forward to seeing people live and in person at Black Hat and at DEF CON. Looking forward to that. Now, you uh, you wouldn't be able to maybe give us a, what else you're looking forward to at the in the Sin City at, at, all, at all? Any other programs or any other uh, uh, presentations? Well, you know, there, there are a couple of the things, and I'll, I'll be talking more about Black Hat as we get forward. Uh, I can tell you that at DEF CON, the two places where I tend to spend most of my time are the AI and Ooh, yeah. ham radio villages and uh, looking forward to both of those uh, great people always great research being done a lot of cool activities um, and as a matter of fact in just a, a few moments I'm going to be having a little bit of a preview about one of the briefings that's going to be taking place at Black Hat. So in the next couple of weeks lots more to come about uh, what's going to be happening out in the desert. 
Looking forward to it. Well, speaking about lots more to come, we definitely have a, a lot more to come because this enterprise week of news, especially, you know, we talked a lot about screen time for my, minors and it always seems to be a hot topic amongst parents. I know definitely in this household, it definitely is. So uh, you know, the question is, is it good or bad for kids? Well, China thinks it's bad and they have some laws around it. Well, game developers are starting to take it seriously. We'll talk about just how serious a little bit later. Plus, ZDI, the Zero Day Initiative, has been a huge successful program over the last 15 years. Now, today's guest, Dustin Childs, is the communications manager of ZDI. He's going to take us through a bit of the history of the ZDI and just how impactful it really has been. But before we get to all that, we do have to jump into this week's news blips. Now, when was the last time you looked for a more secure mobile phone? Maybe an encrypted phone? Well, it gives you a peace of mind. And, you know, once you find one, of course. Well, you may have heard it was revealed that an encrypted phone company was actually a front for a gargantuan FBI operation called Trojan Shield. Now, the company, which was a really a law enforcement honeypot, sold a product called Anam and an encrypted chat application installed on specific hardened phones that the Bureau was secretly distributing to track and monitor organized crime groups. Now, criminals thought that they were getting a secure and penetrable communication platform, but in reality, their networks were owned by the FBI and other law enforcement agencies, the devices having been designed by the Bureau in collaboration with a high-level criminal informant who had previously sold such hardened encrypted devices to underworld networks. Now, it's been reported that those phones are weirdly being resold on a secondary market, popping up on things like Craigslist forums and other online retailers. Now, online forums devoted to Android merchandise have been a buzz which talk about how these phones stripped off of their original powers now seem to be circulating as cheap used products sold to unsuspecting buyers who just want to you know, get an affordable device here and there. Now, upon first glance, the phone seemed normal, but a user inputs a PIN to log in and is then taken to what looks to be a fairly normal home screen. But the device comes equipped with what are essentially decoy apps, stuff like Netflix, Instagram, Snapchat, and Tinder-like applications. But if you click on them, they don't actually work. Now, instead of you know getting the functional interface, the user has to reset the phone and type on a different PIN. Doing this resets the home screen, leaving only a clock and a calculator app on the device settings. Now, if the calculator app is clicked on it, it delivers a new login screen, prop prompting you to enter the Anom ID and a password. Now, from there, the phone's real purpose is to act as an encrypted clandestine communication channel. Um, now, to me, this is a lesson being, you know, being frugal as well as trying to target the world's most secure mobile devices. Now, they never seem to go together, right? That means think twice before buying an oddly cheap phone for secure communications. Well, there's a new patch out there, and you need to be installing it as we speak. Microsoft has rushed out an emergency security update for Print Nightmare, a critical remote code execution vulnerability present in all versions of the Windows operating system. In an advisory Tuesday afternoon, the company urged organizations to apply the patches immediately, saying it had detected active exploitation of the bug. Now, for enterprises that are unable to patch immediately, Microsoft recommended they implement several workarounds and mitigations it released on Monday. Concerns over print nightmare first surfaced last week when one of the three researchers who discovered the bug, all from China-based Sangfor Technologies, released proof-of-concept code on GitHub showing how an attacker could successfully exploit the vulnerability. Though the researcher quickly took down the code, it had already been copied, meaning it was available in the wild. Microsoft itself has described Print Nightmare as similar to, but distinct from, the bug in Windows Print Spooler that the company patched in June. A remote code execution vulnerability, vulnerability exists when the Windows Print Spooler service improperly performs privileged file operations. The flaw allows attackers a way to gain system-level privileges on vulnerable devices. An attacker could then install programs, view, change, or delete data, or create new accounts with full user rights. Successful exploitation could result in complete loss of system confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Now, Print Nightmare adds to the long list of bugs that security researchers have dug up in the Windows Print Spooler service over the years. 
The security researchers who discovered the flaw are scheduled to disclose full details of the bug and other zero-day flaws they claim to have discovered in the software. Where else? But at Black Hat USA 2021. So this story, well, remember, we have a new Federal Trade Commission chair. And this chair has decided we're going to issue a proposed consent order to settle charges that Broadcom Incorporated illegally monopolized markets for semiconductor components used for television and broadband internet services through an exclusive dealing and related conduct is how it's worded. Well, the FTC said that under the consent order, Broadcom must stop requiring its customers to source components from Broadcom on an exclusive or near-exclusive basis. The FTC alleged in its complaint that Broadcom is a monopolist in the sale of three types of chips used in devices that deliver television and broadband internet services. So, my real comment on this is that I would think that Broadcom is certainly wishing it hadn't managed to drive Intel out of those market segments because then they wouldn't have been a monopoly and maybe the FTC wouldn't have gone out of it. Um, is it ever a good thing for only one manufacturer to be producing anything? Don't know. Makes you go, hmm. Good question, good question. Well, since 2015, the Federal Communication Commission has maintained that minimum broadband speed. It should stay the same is the question, which is 25 megabits per second for downloading and 3 megabits per second for uploading. Now, a government watchdog is now telling the FCC to reevaluate these rules in a new report, saying small businesses in 2021 require more bandwidth to effectively run their operations. Now, the report produced by the Government Accountability Office allows also shows examples of small businesses around the country which aren't even getting the minimum speed required by the FCC. Now, the FCC has admitted that it is, has very little reliability on the data on whether people are actually getting the mandated minimum speeds or access at all. Now, its broadband coverage maps are based on self-reported data from internet providers who are incentivized to overstate their coverage to get around regulations. And it has, it has attempted to be to actually create speed test apps to get more direct information and collected complaints directly from customers. But the GAO contends that there's enough evidence to reconsider the current rules. Now, reports from small businesses shows that many want a minimum of 100 megabit per second download speed and about one gigabyte per second for offices with dozens of employees. Now, even Zoom actually recommends 3.8 megabits per second of upload speeds to, to make that high definition call, which exceeds that federal minimum. Now, one Ver Vermont Inn and Spa owner said that they pay $78 per month for a substandard 10 megabit per second speeds and upgrading to 40 megabit would cost $335 per month. Ah, raising the minimum benchmark of 100 megabits down and 10 megabits up would have a long-term effect for people in rural communities who suffer most from these internet deserts, the GAO writes. Now, the change would lower the percentage of rural Americans who are considered to have acceptable broadband coverage from 83% to 67%, a strong argument that providers need to actually invest more in rural infrastructure. We knew that. Now, personally, this could have another effect, a cascading effect, and cause the internet companies to actually charge more in areas they don't, they already offer internet in order to fund the infrastructure areas that they don't. Now, unless there's regulation around pricing models, and this could get a little bit crazy quickly. Now, one hopes there's more plans to also increase the amount of competition in those markets to help drive the innovation and expansion with much less residual effects. See what happens. Well, folks, that does it for the blips. Next up, we have the bites. But before we get to the bites, we have to thank a really great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Indava. Now, season two of Indava's podcast, Tech Reimagined, is now out. Now, Tech Reimagined brings together leading tech personalities and industry experts such as Guy Kawasaki, as well as Mary Williams, Alex Hunter, Brian McBride, Tom Gruber, Dave Coplin, Inma Martinez, Viola Llewellyn, and many many more. The podcast discusses the big questions around technology and its industries. Guests and hosts will be talking about how these trends impact our everyday lives and how our relationship with technology is constantly being 
Reimagined. Now check out the episodes Insurance Reimagined. Now it's parts one and parts two where guests Anne Norklet and Kevin Crawford discuss the role IT plays in the insurance industry. Or the two episodes about the role of AI Reimagined where Boris Sergal and Radu Orgadon talk about the regulations and accountability and expectations that arise when using AI to solve complex problems. Now they discuss what the future holds for this technology and for the individuals who are using it on a daily basis. Interested in shopping? Well, catch parts one and parts two of our shopping experience reimagined with guests Thomas Beecham and Jeremy Mays, where they dive into some of the most significant shifts they've seen in consumer behavior over the last 12 months, including the increasing popularity of direct-to-consumer and buy-online pickup in-store, and how the shift to digital is pushing people and companies to actually reimagine the way we shop. Now, Andava has been reimagining the relationship between technology and people. Tech Reimagine explores this relationship on a deeper level with a look at the most recent experiences with technology and its experts. Learn more about how tech is becoming so much more in this world that is constantly growing and changing. It's a podcast you don't want to miss. Subscribe and listen to Tech Reimagine, the podcast from Adava, from wherever you get your podcast. And we thank Endava for their support of This Week and Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, today on The Bites, we have a couple of good topics here. Now, video games for minors have always been a touchy subject in a household. I have five kids myself, and I, my son has basically grew up with the first generation iPad out there in his hands. Now, the question is, does it really impact them? Well, how does screen time really alter minors, maybe brain chemistry or physical composition of their brain? Well, China decided they needed to do something about it. That's right. A new law enacted in November 2019 limits children under 18 to less than 90 minutes of playing video games on weekdays and three hours on weekends with no video gaming playing allowing between 10 p.m. and 8 a.m. Now, these are set by required gaming game publishers to enforce these limits by based on user logins. Well, some publishers have moved to making this a true reality, but none of them have gone as far as using things like biometrics until now. Now, Tencent, the world's largest Chinese video game publisher, has taken an extreme step to actually comply with these nation rules uh, about limiting minors' access to video games. And as of this week, the publisher actually has added a facial recognition system dubbed Midnight Patrol to over 60 of its China-specific smartphone games, and it will disable gameplay in popular titles like Honor of Kings if users either decline the facial check or fail to use it. Now, or fail at it. Now, in all affected games, once a gameplay session during uh, the nation's official gaming curfew hours exceeds an unspecified amount of time, the game in question will interrupt by prompting to scan the player's face. Now, should an adult fail the the test for any reason, Tencent makes it like too bad, so sad kind of thing, an attitude clear, an announcement. Users can then try to play again the next day. Now, this week's change doubles down on limited facial scan system implemented by Tencent and the Chinese version of Honor Kings in 2018. Since that rollout, we've yet to really hear exactly how the system works. Now, question is, does it really determine the user's age when it scans their facial highlights? Now, does it also maybe cross-reference the data, possibly leverage any other home nation's public facial scanning systems to help with that? Now, Tencent has not clarified any Midnight Patrol's technical details, but parents can now turn on the facial recognition system that checks specifically for approved parents before allowing gameplay to unlock through its unclear way. Now, um, in addition... There is also some additional additional uh, kind of sidestepping that that users are trying to do. Obviously, you got a lot of uh, miners out there that want to continue to play their games, especially outside the curfew hours, and so you have you know systems uh, or, or even people trying to look for ways around it. And I'm sure that you know masks somehow come into play there. I want to bring my co-host back in uh, because again, this is this is a big hot topic, especially in my household. Now, Curtis, what do you think about this law? You know. Is the developer who's doing this with the facial scan, is that really doing anything? Is it really a good thing that they're, you know, they have this law? What do you think of this all? Well, I, th- I think it's like a lot of other uh, systems that use fac- facial recognition. It's going to depend on how it's changed, how it's trained, um, and just how limited the uses are. I mean, if this is something where during 
the initial login period, it does a scan and, you know, I can imagine the sort of biometric factors it looks for to try and figure out the age of the person in front of the camera. Uh, that's one thing. But we all know and have seen examples of the fact that once you allow a system to use input devices, whether it's camera, microphone, keyboard, mouse, whatever, um, the temptation is there for that application to continue using it. So I think that what we have is something that is, as it's presented today, Probably not horribly intrusive, but the implications in the future are pretty dramatic. I mean, how far are we from a facial recognition that matches the user's face to the face at the time the license was granted to the code uh, and can come back and say, I'm sorry, you're not the licensed user of this program? Um you know, all kinds of interesting possibilities exist. It's just going to depend on how far we go and how much we trust the people behind the camera. You know, I definitely can tell you from experience, you know, a lot of parents out there, they sometimes use screen time as a babysitter mechanism, right? I mean, obviously, a lot of people who are working from home now, they, they need to to be able to watch their kids, they don't have daycare or whatnot, or maybe they only have a certain amount of daycare, and they sometimes use screen time to assist with that. I, I think that this will definitely impact that, obviously, China pushing forward on their laws and restricting more screen time. The question is, how much impact? And it's now ingrained in the current you know, fabric of people's lives uh, using screens, different types of screens, gaming systems. Cheever, I want to throw this over to you. Obviously, you know, you've, you've worked in education for a long time, you know, how did, how did you have this kind of see maybe even impact some of your students, right? Right. Obviously, as they've used screens, uh, as they've kind of gone through your, your programs, is it, does it impact them in a good way, bad way? What do you think of this law? Well, first off, I should qualify this. Most of my, the teaching I've done has been at the university level. Now, I did do a short stint at the uh, high school level, and... One of the things that did come up at a parent teacher association meeting was how do what's going on? My kids won't get off their computer. You know, <laughs> is this good or bad? And it's like, we don't know. Um, you know, at one end, we were saying, gee, if the kids turned on about something and about especially about technology and had to learn something new, that's a really good thing. But what about games? You know, games can be both good and bad, you know, if they're educational, you know, so forth. But you have that whole attitude of you're sitting in front of the boob tube, your brain is going to rot and dribble out your ears. I've heard that from parents over and over and over <laughs> again. And it's something that, it's flip a coin on which side someone's on. You know, it's a lot of parents' um, nightmare of walking in, checking on their, their son or daughter, and there's a glow coming out from under their blankets because they're, you know, they're on the screen again. <laughs> and, you know, I, I, I'm actually getting screen time reports from my iOS devices, which I thought was kind of interesting. Oh, your screen time is up this week or down this week or whatever. It's like, hmm, do I really care? Right. Um, other than maybe I'm spending too much time surfing the internet. Now, I'm going to flip a coin one more time and just look at the potential. Instead of going for just is it good or bad for the child... I'm going to look at it as maybe this, you know, government, in this case China, is using this to kind of break the ice, get people used to having facial recognition because, gee, being able to go and count your population, what they're doing, where they're doing it, this is like the spy master's dream. You know, if, the, if we had this back in World War II, 
or even before that, there would be a very different outcome. So is this big brother-ish? I think so. Um, the Ars Technica story is really going crazy on the draconian restriction on childhood gaming hours. And um, yeah, it, it, flip a coin. You know, the world is going to be split on this. That's that's pretty much the bottom line. Is it good? Is it bad? Maybe. Um, your opinion matters. So I'm actually interested. You know, hit me on Twitter. I'd like to know, do you think this is good? This is bad? Um, there's certainly parental controls available for iOS or Android devices. And if there's some educators, you know, especially child psycho psychologists, is screen time really that bad? Um, is the screen time providing a kickstart for young minds education? I don't know. I'm not an expert, but I'd like to hear from some. Good point. Good point. Now, I, I personally, I have a little bit of an opinion on this. I, I definitely think screen time is, you know, restricting is a good thing. Uh, but I think that this particular law um, is a little bit too much oversight. I think that, you know, you're, you're basically trying to parent from afar uh, from one perspective and then, of course, forcing game companies to, to kind of apply uh, their rules. But in the same sense, it does open the door, like you were saying, to the other side of the coin, which is now you know, what is it actually being used for? Is it really being used for trying to regulate and parent from afar or is it being used for something else? And so that's also something very curious that, uh, that I've been wondering about this as well. But we'll have to see uh, as it evolves over time. Well, folks, that does it for that bite. Let's move on to the next bite because the next bite's pretty interesting. I think this has hit me, hit home for me many, many times, the concept of right to repair. And obviously we've talked about this quite a bit, but the question is, you know, are companies doing right by the right to repair laws? Um, now, there could be something coming coming very soon that could be blocking uh, for that those DIY fixes. I want to throw this uh, over to one of you guys uh, to maybe talk about this first. Chibert? Well, I think what we need to do is keep in mind where this came from. This is really and truly starting because the farmers in America got fed up with John Deere specifically, but you know, when you're paying a hundred or hundred fifty thousand dollars for a piece of farm equipment, you wanna be able to go and fix it yourself. Because for those of you that don't know about modern farming, your window to harvest or plow or whatever is very tiny. And what happens is people go, you know, these combines or such are mega expensive and they go from farm to farm to farm because everybody kind of rents time on them. So if a large harvester breaks down in the middle of harvest, you could potentially lose a large amount of your crop if it's not fixed quickly. Farmers want to be able to do their own fixes. They tend to be self-reliant folks. Now, the computer industry has really gotten onto it. In fact, um, Steve Wozniak um, came out and did a mega rant um, recently saying, hey, it, I got started, quote unquote, with Apple because we were tinkering. If it was a closed environment, I don't think Apple would have come to be. Um, quite a few things follow that same trend. So... The right to repair has been the battle cry of people all over the place. In fact, I've got a toolkit sitting on my shelf right over there from iFixit. They have been very, very vocal on the right to repair. And in fact, they buy devices as they come out and do teardowns and judge on how well and how easy they are to repair. So this is going to be yet another super, super polarizing topic that I'm sure is going to be really interesting to watch. Agreed, agreed. 
Curtis, I want to throw this to you. I mean, obviously, from even from you know an enterprise perspective, you're developing potentially an, uh, a product, and that product goes through stringent manufacturing. It goes through uh, the specific processes that you follow to make sure the device comes out the other end in pristine order. And some of those things require things like gluing the devices down or preventing uh, third parties from modifying the device because obviously it could bring it out of its normal functionalities, especially things like medical devices and other things. Now, how do you think this, these, these types of laws will actually impact uh, organizations and enterprises if, if they were to be enacted? Well, let's be clear. The, the place where these are, are hitting home and the, the only place where they really have any import is when it comes to the software that lives inside the devices. Uh, John Deere has never said that if, you know, a, a tine breaks off of an implement that the, um, the farmer can't weld it back on. They've never said that, you know, if a, a tire goes flat on a tractor that the farmer can't fill it. What they're talking about is the software that lives at the heart of modern farm equipment and to expand at the heart of pretty much modern everything. You know, I had a conversation with engineers from Ford and General Motors a few years back. And at that point, this has got to be in the mid 20 teens, they were saying that more than half of the value of one of their vehicles was in software. Mm-hmm. So it's one thing to say that you can see what's going on. Um, most modern vehicles have an OBD2 port where you can get codes. But can you go in and if there's an issue, change those codes? You know, in the automotive world, there is a fairly hot market for tuners who reflash a system. Uh, for modern pickup trucks, especially diesels, you can go and get them reflashed to pr- uh, provide greater economy or, in most cases, greater horsepower. But John Deere had asserted that that software inside their tractors um, doesn't belong to the people who bought the tractor. You know, you might have bought the physical box, but the software living inside that tractor, you just have a license to that, and it belongs to John Deere. Um, And, you know, Lou, I I would say it's similar to the situation you might find yourself in. You help create software for a company. Um, Would you assert that if, a piece of software isn't doing exactly what the customer wants it to do, that they should have the right to go in, see the source code, and modify it to fit their own needs. My guess is you would be unhappy about that from both a business and a personal standpoint. I mean, professionally, you don't want every user out there mucking about with your code. If you did want that to happen, then you would be involved in an open source project somewhere. So this is one where the right to repair, I think, is is a good right. It, it speaks to the traditional American values. It tr- speaks to the, the idea of buying ser- something versus licensing that thing. Um, but like virtually everything else in the modern world, it's just a little bit more complex than easy to, to get at seven second sound bites allow for right right fair enough i think i definitely agree with that i think you know we you know obviously i we develop software from you know, I'm, I'm on the office team we develop software that we have intended usages for uh and if there's an annoyance with that software that people don't like you know obviously we had had people in the past attempt to correct that and they might not correct it in the right way and they might create a cascading effect and cause other problems and, you know, and then that creates a problem for the manufacturer, the developer, uh, let's say John Deere or whatnot, because then somebody's going to want 
service for things to go better for, you know and again are they breaking their end user licenses or are they you know are they are we have to go down the whole law route road of is this software really the original that we gave them um, so that we can go and, and provide a patch or a fix for so it does create a lot of complex uh, combinatory matrix matrices of issues uh, I think when it when it goes to those types of things, but in the same sense, you know there are some advantages. Like we've seen, especially in the John Deere case, when it comes to microcontrollers or controllers, you know, you talked about maybe updating, you know, the chips in the car. Well, you can update, you know, similar processors and, and controllers in the farming devices as well to make them more efficient or be able to control, you know, or, or, or via GPS or whatnot. And those are all upgradable and, and and sometimes they're blocked by the manufacturer because they can't afford to go test it on all the different versions. And so consumers can go and, and run these updates themselves. Uh, but again, it, it, there's I definitely see mo- bo- both sides of these things. Um, and the last thing is actually Tesla. I mean, Tesla is one of those things that have been pretty open about the fact that they don't want their their devices, their cars, their and, and, and their vehicles to be cracked open and software being modified. Although people are doing it, you see it all over the web. Uh, you know, they want it to be kind of a closed door scenario that's delivered remotely, uh, that's, you know, housed and secure, uh, and it's only updated by them. Um, so I think, you know, these are, it's interesting times. I think that it really depends on the scenario, uh, but I, I do agree there's, there's kind of two ways of the story. Well, folks, that does it for the bites. Next up, we have my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twilight Ride. But before we get to that, we do have to thank another great sponsor of this week in Enterprise Tech. And that's ESET. Now, for over 30 years, ESET has been a global leader in cybersecurity, and it's the provider we actually rely on here at Twit. Now, successful ransomware attacks are in the news every day, and as a small business, we need to be protected from these attacks with a solution we can really trust. Now, with nearly 2,400 U.S. companies, healthcare facilities, and more falling victim to ransomware in 2020 alone, we trust ESET to keep us from becoming a statistic. Now, their solutions block advanced threats with multiple layers of protection built right in and a light system footprint so you don't even know it's there. Now, we're excited to talk to you about ESET Protect Advanced. It has a ton of great things you can take advantage of right away. Now, let's talk about the security management console and what it gives you. It gives you real-time visibility of all your endpoints and plays a vital role in preventing and detecting ransomware. Plus, you can even use it on-premise or in the cloud. And with advanced features like server security, mail security, and more, they help you sleep a little bit more sound at night knowing you're protected. Not only does ESET care about protecting your business with solutions like ESET Protect Advance, they offer resources specifically designed for employees to protect themselves and your company against things like ransomware and phishing attempts. Now, one of those resources is actually multi-factor authentication. If MFA is not already in place at your company, you'll want to seriously consider ESET Secure authentication as it's essential to preventing ransomware and other invasive attacks. Now, MFA is user-friendly for employees and easy to deploy for you. It can also be used with Office 365, Google Apps, and Dropbox. Now, once your employees log in and endpoints are secure with MFA, it's time to train them for battle against online scams, right? Well, you, you've heard this stat before, but that 95% of all breaches are caused by human error. So your first line of defense to make things better is always going to be your employees. Now, ESET has made learning fun with their cybersecurity awareness training and interactive gamified training that employees and teaches employees how to recognize phishing and create strong passwords and follow best practices on the internet all in under 90 minutes. Now, we've been using ESET for years. And as you can see, they continue to innovate not only through their products, but educational tools that can add a vital layer of protection to your business. You're definitely going to want to check them out. Successful ransomware attacks are in the news every day. Trust ESET to keep you from becoming just a statistic. Try an interactive demo of ESET Protect Advance at business.eset.com slash twit. Ransomware protection that means business. Get protected today. Learn more at business.eset.com slash twit. And we thank ESET for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, it's my favorite part of the show. We actually get to bring in a guest to drop some knowledge on the Twire Riot. Today, we have Dustin Chow. He's communication manager of ZDI at Trend Michael Micro. Welcome to the show, Dustin. Hi, thanks for having me. Happy to be here. Absolutely. Now, our audience loves to hear people's origin stories. Can you maybe take us through a short journey through tech and what brought you to ZDI and Trend Micro? 
Sure. So I actually got my start in tech in the U.S. Air Force in 1997. I was actually assigned to the unit uh, that is catching hackers, the Air Force Computer Emergency Response Team, or AFCERT. Uh, so as you can imagine, 97 was very much different in the tech world. Uh, it was back before Google, back before YouTube and Facebook and everything else. We were we were thrilled when we caught a port scan. Uh, so a little bit different than today. Uh, from that, I, I spent 15 years in government work, and then I went to Microsoft at the Microsoft Security Response Center. Uh, they are responsible for Patch Tuesday. Uh, so at one point, I had sent more patches out than anyone else in Microsoft history, so there's a pretty good chance I inadvertently rebooted your machine at some point. <laughs> uh, and then at the end of 2014, I decided it would be uh, a little bit easier to send bugs to Microsoft than to be on the receiving end. So I went to the Zero Day Initiative, and I've been there ever since. Uh, and uh, it's been a really fun journey to see uh, bugs from the very beginning when they get reported through the end of patching and then getting installed worldwide. So it's been a it's been a fun journey. Fantastic. Now, you know, we, we've heard a lot about ZDI in the past, but I want to start from the beginning because a lot of people might not be aware of this program and how it's evolved over time. Can you maybe take us through that? Sure. So ZDI was founded in 2005 at the time by 3Com. Uh, which owned the Tipping Point Intrusion Prevention System. And uh, it was a, it's a vendor agnostic bug bounty program, which means that we buy bugs across the spectrum of multiple vendors. Uh, most bug baiting programs, uh, like Microsoft has one, Google has one, Apple has one, they're buying bugs in just Microsoft, Apple, Google. Well, we buy bugs across the board for Microsoft, for Apple, for Google, for IBM, for Cisco, for you name it, we're likely looking to acquire bugs. And really, the program was founded to increase the threat intelligence of tipping points, uh, which was then subsequently bought by HP, uh, spun out as part of the HP Enterprise, and then in 2015 was acquired by Trend Micro. Uh, so we moved there at that point. And uh, it's gone from in our, our first year, we published one advisory on uh, a Dell EMC backup bug, believe it or not. And then last year, we had our business year ever, we published uh, 1,453 advisories, so a little bit of growth over 15 years, uh, and we are regularly doing over 1,000 bugs a year. Uh, I think we're currently at like 780 so far this year. So it's been uh, it's been an amazing journey to see, especially these last, uh, gosh, I guess it's been six years since I've been with the program, uh, the growth not only in the program itself but in uh, everything from the Pondone competitions to the various research we do internally to seeing you know the worldwide community of independent security researchers uh, come together to find some really great bugs and uh, we work to what we do with those bugs is uh, the first thing we do is we hand them off to our digital filters team and we build protections for trend micro customers that they get rolled out ahead of time but then we report the bugs to the vendors and we work with the vendors to get them patched and right now we currently have a 120 day disclosure timeline uh, to from the time that the vendor is notified so that they know that they can't just sit on a bug. They actually have to react to it and produce a, a patch, make that publicly available. Uh, otherwise, we uh, will drop it O-Day and we'll uh, put some information out there to kind of give uh, enterprise customers some knowledge that, hey, there's this thing that you need to be aware of that is not patched, and here's some advice on how to protect yourself from it. So it's been a, a great 15 plus years now, and we look forward to continuing the program. Sounds like, no, this is interesting because a lot of organizations, obviously, they, they get hit with these advisories and they say, hey, we need to go patch, or we need to go find a solution, we need to shut down a service. Now, we've heard a lot about common, the CVE, the common vulnerabilities and exposures. Um, yes. uh, you know, with, how is that related to this? Uh, well, each bug that we... A patch, each bug that we advisory we publish is subject to being a CVE. So we have our own ZDI number that we assign to it, but then it's also assigned a CVE by a CVE numbering authority, a CNA. Uh, we are a CNA, Microsoft is a CNA, uh, other big uh, corporations are CNAs, and we work with MITRE to make sure that uh, bugs are being labeled appropriately and giving appropriate numbers. There's very specific rules for how CVEs are assigned. For example, if you have one root cause bug, but maybe three different paths to get there, that's really only one CVE instead of uh, three bugs 
So we're, it's very, we have to be careful that we are assigning uh, the CVEs correctly and make sure that enterprises understand the real risk of what they're, uh, what they're using. Now, recently, obviously, we've seen a lot more ransomware attacks and, and different other botnets and so on uh, that are related to some of these zero-day uh, vulnerabilities. How have you seen it kind of expanded? How, how has it evolved really just over the last, even just the pandemic time and just the, the last like year and a half time? Yeah, and the last year and a half has been probably the busiest that we've ever been. Uh, there, I, I don't know if it's just people staying home and looking for bugs more often, or if they're looking to supplement their income because you know they got laid off or, or lost some work because of the pandemic. But it's definitely a huge thing, uh, especially with ransomware, because ransomware very rarely will actually use a zero day exploit. Zero day exploits are pretty rare, but they're different than zero day vulnerabilities. Zero day vulnerabilities are very common. You can go to our upcoming page and there's over 500 zero day vulnerabilities that we've reported to vendors that are awaiting security patches. But those zero day vulnerabilities, once they become uh, a patch, become in day vulnerabilities and in day vulnerabilities get wrapped up into exploits very, very commonly. Bugs are hard to find unless it's the second Tuesday of the month. Then Microsoft is going to tell you, uh, here's where all of these bugs are. Uh, and Adobe tells you, and then they can reverse engineer, attackers reverse engineer that. Uh, and yeah, they, then that, that's what gets rolled into ransomware. Uh, so the zero day vulnerabilities become the end day exploits. And you get, as you can see, there's a list of everything that's coming up that we've reported on the various vendors, whether it be Foxit or Microsoft or Parallels Desktop. Uh, and you'll notice Trend Micro there too. We do purchase bugs in Trend Micro programs. So um, for, for this particular list, obviously there's a, a large list of vulnerabilities that are already there. In fact, what I've seen over the last year personally, um, and I see a lot more researchers kind of digging deep and digging in and finding vulnerabilities in areas where I, I haven't seen vulnerabilities before. So this could be some older pieces of software, software that might have been like, for instance, in a Linux system or in a Mac OS system or a Windows system for a long time that that could potentially that maybe not have been touched for a while. They can you know, look at the binaries and say, hey, these, this hasn't been touched in a while. And they look to go and figure out the vulnerabilities in there. Now, the question is to you, what's driving that? Is it is it really just fame? Is it is it is it is it the money? What, what is it? What is actually driving this kind of you know, uh, digging into some of these systems? Uh, from my perspective, there's not one single driver. For some people, it is uh, fame or no notoriety that they're looking to establish their name or or get that cred for finding an O day or, or whatever. For some people, it is very much financially motivating, uh, especially depending on where you're at in the world. Uh, you know, a five ten thousand dollar bounty in certain countries could potentially be life changing. Uh, so there is definitely financial motiva motivation for some people. It really is just curiosity uh, that they're driven to understand how things work, and they see something and they really want to go in and, and just rip it apart and find out what's there. And uh, so it's really a combination of things. Uh, with, you know, some people, uh, I use the the old acronym MICE uh, when I was had a clearance. You're trained, look for people, uh, money, ideology, coercion, and ego. That's how they make spies. So you got to watch out for that. Uh, and I just changed the C. So a money, ideology, curiosity, and ego. Uh, that's, that's really kind of an overview of, of the motivations. But it's, it's definitely a very broad mix of things. Some people are just really curious about stuff. Some people uh, want the money. And it is about the money. Well, when we come back, we have a lot more to talk about here, and I do want to bring my co-host back in. But before we do, we have to thank another great sponsor of This Week in Enterprise Tech, and that's Bitwarden. Now, what is the easiest way for businesses and individuals to store, share, and sync sensitive data? Of course, Bitwarden. Now, storing and sharing passwords and sensitive data has never been easier. Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, on the go, or at work, and it's trusted by millions of individuals, teams, and organizations worldwide. But now, my experience with Bitwarden is just how easy it is to get it integrated with any organization's workflow. You can onboard really quickly and start securing your data right now. Now, businesses need to empower employees to follow password management practices. Now, by giving your employees Bitwarden, they can securely store credentials across personal and the business world. Now, every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault. Now, use Bitwarden for your business. Now, when an individual joins a team or a company, they can be assigned access 
to shared credentials. Now, quicker access means quicker and easier productivity. Now, it's fully customizable. You can adjust the features using enterprise policies to adapt to your business needs. Plus, Bitwarden also just released a few new features, including Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether text or files, directly to anyone. Now, team members can generate unique and secure passwords for every site and ensure passwords are not used more than once. You'll minimize the risk of using weak and vulnerable passwords. Now, you'll get enterprise-grade security because Bitwarden conducts third-party security audits and is compliant with major privacy and security standards, including GDPR, CCP, A, HIPAA, and SOC 2. Now, unite your existing systems with Bitwarden using SSO authentication, directory services, or powerful APIs, and a fully featured CLI, command line interface, for your use. Now, their end-to-end encrypted vault helps mitigate phishing attacks by storing passwords and more. Now, interested in a business plan? Well, Bitwarden has plans for all sizes. Now, their organization, Teams organization option is $3 a month per user where you can share private data securely with your coworkers, department, or the entire organization. Now, this plan is, also has full management and user groups. Now for enterprises, use Bitwarden's enterprise organization plan for just $5 a month per user. You can store business secrets securely and enable enterprise policies, SSO authentication, and an option to actually self-host. Now you wanna learn how Bitwarden organizations work? Well, check out their free organization plan. It includes two users who can store and share secure passwords. Now, Bitwarden believes that everyone should have access to basic password security tools. Now, individuals can actually use their basic free account forever on for an unlimited number of passwords across any number of devices or upgrade anytime to their premium account for less than a dollar a month, giving you premium password security and management features across the board. Now, if you're looking for secure password storage for your entire family, well, their family organization option gives up to six users premium features for only $3.33 a month. Now, using the Bitwarden Cloud, you can get started in no time or self-host if preferred. Now, monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using the Bitwarden Vault Health Reports. Identify exposed, reused, weak, or potential compromised passwords, as well as any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise trial of Teams or Enterprise plan at bidwarden.com slash twitch or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. And we thank Bitwarden for their support of This Week in Enterprise Tech. Well, folks, let's jump back into the guest side of things. Now we have Dustin Childs here. He's talking about the ZDI program. It's a really great program, but I do want to bring my co-hosts back in because obviously they work in the industry. They talk a lot about vulnerabilities and so on. Uh, I want to throw this to to Chibert first. Chibert. Okay. We're, let, let's put it this way. A lot of people in tech tend to be very U.S. centric, but I don't, I got this hunch that people creating, finding these bugs, and unfortunately people that are creating these zero day attacks are spread all over the world. Are you able to share anything about the geographic dispersion of either the source or the counter on your bug, your zero day and your ZDI um, details? Uh, yeah, actually, I can. Uh, so we are a global community. We work with independent researchers around the world, six continents. Uh, I haven't breached Antarctica yet. I'm hoping uh, I've got some contacts in penguin colonies down there that hopefully they'll be submitting soon. But it really is a global community. Uh, and there are some real uh, hotspots right now of research that may not be very obvious to a lot of people. For example, we're seeing a lot of great research come out of uh, Vietnam right now. Uh, Africa is starting to be a hotspot. One of our best researchers lives in Senegal, and we have several submitters from uh, Egypt that are reporting some really cool stuff to us. And of course, you know, we see tons of submissions from Europe and North America, but plenty from South America as well. So it really is a global community that are reporting these bugs. Super cool. So you guys had a contest called Pwn to Own. Yes. What is it? You know, what? tell us about it. So Pwndown actually started in 2007, which, you know, in internet years is prehistoric. Uh, but it was started with a very simple concept. 
uh, a conference organizer named Dragos Ryu has a con- uh, conference up in Vancouver. And uh, the reputation for Apple's at the time was that they just didn't have any security flaws at all. That was the public perception. But security practitioners knew better. So he had a MacBook and he put it on the network. He said, if you pwn it, you can own it. That means you would win the map. If you hack the MacBook, you would take the MacBook. And he said, ZDI, would you pay for the bug? And he said, yes, we'll give you $10,000 for it. And from that simple demonstration, Pondo has grown into now three different competitions. Our most recent one, we awarded over $1.2 million in cash and prizes. And it's gone from just web browsers to uh, virtual machines, to web browsers, to operating systems, to enterprise applications. Uh, We have uh, a a contest in the fall that we call Pondo in Tokyo. That's coming up uh, before too long. It now focuses on consumer devices. So we have, uh, it started as mobile Pondo with with, uh, mobile phones, but it's grown into smart speakers and televisions. We had uh, network attached storage, uh, as well as, you know, the wearables and other things that consumers would use. And then starting in 2020, we have a Pondo in Miami, which focuses on industrial control and SCADA systems. So that's a really fun, uh, first of all, going to Miami in January is never a bad trip. But then uh, to interact with that community, which we normally don't interact very much with, uh, they're a very enclosed, uh, close-knit community. Uh, but we were able to partner with several vendors there to really uh, get some great research in the ICS and SCADA world uh, on HMI's uh, human machine interface, as well as some other uh, SCADA products. So it's grown from that one little thing to now three times a year where we hold these big competitions. We have people from all over the world. Uh, and it's actually one of the benefits, one of the, the silver linings of the pandemic is we've been able to allow now remote uh, participation before you actually had to physically be at the conference. Now we're allowing remote participation. So people from around the world, we had uh, people from Germany participate, people from Asia, uh, as well as North America, and even uh, Russia participate in this last event. So it's been really fantastic to see it grow. And uh, $1.2 million completely blew our budget, but it was really cool. We saw some great research at Microsoft Exchange that was hacked multiple times. Microsoft Teams, as well as uh, Zoom Communicator were hacked. Uh, the Zoom bug was really spectacular. It was zero click to code execution. So just if you had Zoom open, uh, an attacker could take over your system. So pretty wild. Uh, but all of the operating systems were uh, exploited. The browsers were exploited. We saw one bug that was used both against Google Chrome and Edge Chromium. So that was kind of a double shot. Uh, they got a nice bonus for that. I think we paid them an additional $50,000 for the one bug against the two browsers. So some really great research over three days and it's a lot of fun. It's a way where we can pay close to exploit broker prices uh, and get some really good research out in the open that might not see the light of day otherwise. Fantastic. Curtis? Well, you know, I, I love the idea of the bug bounties and the, the contest, but you talk about being device and system agnostic. Mm-hmm. At the same time, we know that we've seen some some news articles about companies that take a very dim view of researchers finding vulnerabilities in their systems and threatening uh, under various laws regarding unauthorized use of systems and unauthorized access of systems uh, to prosecute researchers. How do you square these these two different ideas about what researchers should be able to do? Right. Uh, and w- believe me, we have our fair share of lawyers and run-ins with lawyers from various companies over the years. Uh, and we never encourage anyone to violate any terms of service or any licensing agreements that they've signed to. Uh, at the same time, uh, our point of view is it's better to uh, have the the quote unquote good guys, the, the those folks who are doing independent research for legitimate reasons, uh, be fairly compensated for their research. And uh, through a vendor agnostic program like ours, we're holding the vendor accountable as well. Uh, because there have been instances as well where for a vendor specific program, once they buy a bug, there's no there's no rule that says they have to fix it. They just purchased your intellectual property. Now they could sit on it. 
That's not the case with a vendor agnostic program like ours. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why people come to ZDI rather than going to that vendor specific program, because they know that we can handle that disclosure process. That disclosure process can be very tricky to navigate, especially for either new researchers or for vendors who have not dealt with disclosure a lot. Certain vendors, Microsoft, Apple, Cisco, they've been doing this for years. They've got the, the process down pretty well. Uh, but some of the newer vendors, uh, that was one of the eye-opening things that we saw with Pondo in Miami. Uh, and one of the great reasons why we were able to work with those vendors is because they weren't really receiving bugs from independent security researchers and didn't quite know how to deal with it. So we were able to help them through that process uh, and say, here's here's what you need to do. Here's how you communicate with folks. And here's you know even simple things like, here's PGP, and you need to send your emails in PGP encrypted throughout all this stuff to make sure that ODAs stay unknown to the bad guys while we are fixing it. Uh, so I, I think there's a line where, yes, this line can get crossed, especially when you're talking about, oh, I'm going to take down an online service or I'm going to rain all over your cloud, you know, things like that. But uh, it, I still think there's a big place for security researchers who are able to find bugs, report them, get fairly compensated, and in some cases, if they want to be recognized, be recognized, and then have the vendors held accountable to actually fix the bugs too, because that's what we really want. We want the bugs fixed before they're exploited. Uh, and our program, I, I think, is a great way that that can happen. You know, I'm glad you brought that up. Um, Earlier in the program, I was talking about uh, the flaw that had been found in the Microsoft print services and the mm -hmm. fact that a researcher uh, put a proof of concept up on GitHub, not for a very long time, but long enough to let it get out in the wild. You know, how much of a process is it to talk to potential participants in these programs um, and tell them, you know, how rare this sort of thing is? And, and you know, do you find that you are having to spend a lot of time convincing companies that this isn't just opening them up to, to random exploits that will be out in the wild for all to see? Right. Over the years, uh, it's definitely been a change. Uh, I know from when I first started in 2014, we had those conversations a lot with a lot of different vendors, especially the newer vendors. Uh, but as as bug bounties become more prop, uh, more, I don't want to say ubiquitous, but there's definitely a lot more bug bounties out there these days than there were in the past. Uh, I think it's become more well known that you need a response process. And with when we're dealing with new vendors, they can look at us. We've got a 15 year track record. We're not some fly-by-night thing that's uh, obviously out to scam them. So they're a little bit more receptive when it comes to dealing with us than dealing with an individual uh, who may or may not be known, who they have no idea. Is this person for real? Are they, you know, are, are they a crackpot? Are they just trying to extort money out of us? What's going on here? Uh, when we have an established program like the ZDI, uh, there is some legitimacy that comes along with that. Uh, and it's another reason why people choose us is is because they know that, okay, a ZDI bug is going to be taken seriously by these vendors. And we still have vendors who are very confused when they uh, are first, even some big vendors. We included them in Pondo Own and they tried to decline, say, no, thank you. We don't want to do that. Like, no, you don't, you don't, you don't understand. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to do this. Uh, and we'd like your, you know, your cooperation through it. It's going to make it better. Uh, and then we worked with that vendor and they ended up having a great time at Pondo and learned a lot about the security research community uh, and how to outreach to researchers and how to work with them. Uh, so I think once companies uh, embrace the fact that there is this community out there and that they can be valuable in helping develop their products and make them more secure, once we get that message through, through to them, they're much more receptive to working with us and to researchers around the world. And Dustin, we do get some questions in our back channel here. We have the Discord channel. Mm -hmm. One question from Blake is actually asking, I'm curious how researchers choose what software to inspect. Do companies pay for people to inspect or do researchers pick random software to try out? Um, I think it's cool and necessary. Um, any thoughts on that one? Yeah, so the, 
there is a bit of randomness to it. Uh, I'm always surprised that when we get questions all the time, so like, hey, do you want to buy bugs and things like something I've never heard of before? Uh, and in some cases, the answer is yes. So it's like we'll reach out and it's like, oh, yeah, we'll buy bugs and that. Um, but one thing about research is when you when you start finding bugs in one area, that shines a huge light uh, onto that area. And then people all kind of congregate to see if there's any bugs that got missed in that area. Uh, and the Prince Fooler uh, bug is a perfect example of this, where Microsoft had one patch uh, and then another, I don't know if it's, a, there's still conflicting reports. Is it a variant of the first bug? Is it the same bug that wasn't fully patched? Regardless, it's researchers that are tearing that up. If you look at our published advisories this year, we've had several print spoolers come in. So I think people will notice if an area, uh, if a piece of software starts getting attention, they'll look at it as well and see, are there other bugs that I might've missed? Uh, or conversely, they'll look at, well, okay, everyone else is looking at the print spooler. I'm gonna go over here and look at this other component and see if there's bugs over here because no one's doing that and I could get ex exclusivity from that. Yeah, there could be some exclusivity there where if you're the only one who's researching a particular component, you could essentially mine it for however much money you can make out of that. Uh, versus if I'm looking at a, a product that other people are finding bugs in, well, at least I know there's bugs there. Let's see if there's any bugs they've missed. Uh, and we see this at Pwned Own as well, where we have collisions. So multiple people finding the same bug. Uh, and that's one of the reasons that those collisions happen is because everyone's looking for bugs in the same place. So they will find bugs right there and then kind of stop versus the people who go in a different direction and find the really unique stuff uh, and are able to kind of get more money out of it that way. So it's it's a mix of, you know, where are the bugs? Where can I find the bugs? How much do the bugs cost? So it's a very interesting thing for people looking for it. Fantastic. Well, unfortunately, all good things must come to an end. Dustin, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate your time. Um, we're running a little long time, but I want to give you the chance to, to tell the folks home where they can find more about ZDI, Trend Micro, Opponent Own, and maybe how they can get involved. Yeah, so we're online at uh, the zero day uh, also on Twitter at the ZDI. Uh, and you can register there to be a researcher. And uh, like I said, if you have questions about the bugs, ZDI at trendmicro.com is our email address and you can just send us an email and we're happy to uh, respond and answer your questions as far as anything goes along those lines uh, and uh, register and, you know, who knows, you could be the next big winner at Pondo. Fantastic. Thanks again. Well, folks, you've done it again. You just have to another out of the best thing enterprise podcast in the universe. So definitely tune your podcatcher to Twyla. I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible. It's definitely a team effort and we have the best team on the market. So I definitely have to thank my co-hosts. Starting with our very own Mr. Brian Chi. Chibert, what's going on for you the coming week and where can people find you? Well, you know, there's been some amazing, amazing suggestions and I keep a list. And from that list, as people go and start PR people pitch um, companies and pitch topics, I try to shuffle them a little bit so that we can put them into themes whenever possible. Doesn't always work. Sorry. Uh, but I try. Anyway, I am on Twitter at A-D-V-N-E-T-L-A-B, Advanced Net Lab. I'm also Chebert, spelled C-H-E-E-B-E-R-T. My students and I had a Dilbert naming theme, so I became Chebert, of course. Anyway, I'm Chebert at twit.tv, but you know, Sending email to twyatt at twit.tv means you hit all the hosts. We'd love to hear from you. I get some great ideas. And like I said, as you folks give me topics, I try really hard to take care of that list and book shows for it. Now, keep in mind, we're <laughs> uh, good or bad. We've gotten kind of popular so I'm booking show. I actually have shows booked for the rest of 2021. Um, so we kind of move things around as possible. But we've got some great shows coming up. I am working through that list. So you don't have to, you know, dump on me about that. I, I am working through the list. And thank you very much. Love to hear from you.
Thanks, g -Root. Well, folks, we also have to thank Mr. Curtis Franklin. Curtis, what's going on for you in the coming weeks, and where can people find you? Sorry about that. I was saying I, w I, was, I, had, I was muted because I was typing, talking to a couple of our viewers. Uh, as for me, I'm taking a few days off uh, to go and do some stuff I haven't been able to do for more than 18 months. Uh, but when I come back, I'm going to be diving hard into the Black Hat DEF CON stuff. As I said, I've already recorded my presentation for the Omdia Analyst Summit, which is on the front end of Black Hat. I've also got a couple of webinars coming up on training and awareness. I will uh, have links to those and maybe even some discount codes up on my Twitter can follow me at KG4GWA. Feel free to send me a direct message there or uh, shoot me email to Kurt at twit.tv. Or as Brian said, twiet at twit.tv and hit all of the hosts simultaneously. <laughs> thank you, Curtis. Well, we also have to thank you as well. You are the person who drops in each and every week to watch and listen to our show to get your enterprise goodness. And we want to make it easy for you to watch and listen to catch up on your enterprise and IT news. So go to our show page right now, twit.tv slash twiet. There you'll find all the amazing back episodes, the show notes, co-host information, guest information, of course, all the links for the stories we do in the show. But more importantly, next to those videos there, you'll get those helpful subscribe and download links. Support the show by getting your audio version, your video version of your choice, and listen on any one of your devices or any one of your podcast applications. We're on, we're on all of them, so definitely subscribe and support the show. Plus, you may have heard of Club Twit. That's right. It is a members only ad free podcast service with a bonus Twit Plus feed that you can get. You can't really get anywhere else. So definitely check that out. It's only seven dollars per month. And like I said, one of my favorite things of that of the Club Twit is that exclusive only members only Discord channel. We have some great conversations in there. We got some great questions from today. Thank you, Blake, for that great question. And of course, we always have some great discussions. So definitely check that out. It's really fun and interesting conversations. Definitely love it. So that's twit.tv slash club twit. Now, after you subscribe, you can impress your friends, your family members, your coworkers with the gift of Twyet because we talk about a lot of fun and interesting stuff here, right? So definitely I guarantee they'll find it interesting and fun as well. So definitely share it with them and uh, get some get some Twyet on the, on the books there. Now, after you subscribe, we're also available live 1.30 p.m. Pacific Fridays. We do the show live at live.twit.tv. That's right. Come see how the pizza's made. Come see the behind the scenes, all the fun stuff we do here at Twit. And of course, if you're going to watch the show live as part of the stream, you might as well be part of our other chat room as well. We have our IRC channel as well as always been there at irc.twit.tv. There are some great characters, some returners, some, some new people in there always talking about some fun stuff. We get some content from them as well. They're not just talking about coffee. So don't worry about that. <laughs> some great topics in there as well. So definitely join the chat room as well. Now hop over right now to twitter.com slash Luma. There you can find me and definitely uh, follow me and find all my tidbits for enterprise uh, and IT news, as well as have some great conversations with people like you. We talk about show topics and other enterprise and IT news topics. I'm going to post some of my home assist uh, Raspberry Pi stuff there pretty soon. I've been building a bunch of IoT devices around my new home and uh, I've been using Home Assist. Uh, it's pretty fun, actually. So I'm going to post some stuff there. And if that, definitely, if you want to check out what I do at Microsoft, you can always check out developers.microsoft.com slash office. There you'll find all the way, great greatest ways to customize your office experience and build it as a platform and make it more customizable and more productive for you. Definitely check out Office Scripts. It's the new latest and greatest ways for you to uh, record macros and actually record and customizations on your Excel online experience. Definitely check that out. Now, I do want to thank everyone who makes this show possible, especially to Leo and Lisa. They continue to support Twyet this weekend enterprise tech for many, many years. And we thank you for all the support. We definitely couldn't do the show without them. So thanks again, Leo and Lisa. Of course, thank you to all the engineers and staff at Twit. We obviously couldn't do the show without them. And of course, thank you to Mr. Brian Chi. He just one more time because he's not only our co-host, but he's also our tireless producer. He does all the show bookings and gets all the plannings for the show. And we couldn't do the show without them. And so thank you again, Chibert, for all your support. And of course, we before we sign out, we have to thank our editor today, John. Thank you so much for all your support. Of course, our TV for today, Mr. Ant Pruitt. He's a talented guy and has some really great shows and content on this week in, in, this week in tech. Uh, and what's going on for you in the coming weeks and what can we find uh, coming from you? 
Well, I'm still having fun chatting with some awesome photographers for hands-on photography, but actually this week I was hooked up with a camera from Canon, the C70, and they let me try it out for our show Hands-On Tech. So I took that Ooh. 4K camera out and shot some little highlight footage of my awesome hard head, hopefully known as my future retirement plan. And, uh, <laughs> you know, it was some good stuff. So check it out, twit.tv slash hot for Hands-On Tech. Fantastic. Thank you, Ann. Appreciate all that you do. Well, and until next time, I'm Louis Moresca, just reminding you, if you want to know what's going on in the enterprise, just keep quiet. Hey, if you like tech news, but you also like hearing about it from the people who are actually writing the stories, well, I've got a show for you. It's called Tech News Weekly, and it's me, Jason Howell, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent. Every week, we invite the people making and breaking the biggest tech news stories from around the web onto this show uh, to talk to us about it. It's a lot of fun. You should check it out. Tech News Weekly can be found at twit.tv slash TNW every Thursday. We'll see you there. 